for LGBTQ channels. Inclusive, unabol unapologetically queer, queer TV 24 seven. These are the taglines of Reverie, an OTT over the top channel launched in 2016 that promotes itself as the go-to site for LGBTQ media content and creators. It's an attempt to provide audiences with over quote, 4,000 hours of TV, films, podcasts, and music, and has led some to hail it as quote, the queer streaming site you always needed in your life, and as a platform quote, serving up all the queer content you need during Pride Month and beyond. Yet, when the press talks about changes in LGBTQ TV representation, it primarily addresses representation on linear television, broadcast and cable networks, and on major streaming platforms. While the US LGBT dedicated cable channels, Logo and Here receive occasional attention and accolades, Logo is most famous for launching RuPaul's Drag Race, smaller and newer internet distributed LGBTQ television platforms such as Reverie and others, including Deco, Happy TV, and Wow Presents Plus are largely absent from these discussions. Reverie, however, offers a useful case study about television channel logics and LGBTQ representation in a time defined by, as, by quote, unfathomable changes in television and discourses of post-gay LGBTQ mainstreaming. Founded by a small group of friends, Reverie bills itself as, quote, the first global streaming network, first queer global streaming network, keyword there. The platform's vision aims to expand the range of LGBTQ representation on TV, to make those representations more widely available, and to give voice to LGBTQ content creators. In a 2020 interview, co-founder Damien Pelosione said, quote, we consider ourselves an impact startup. Palacione's description of Reverie encapsulates the components of the platform that separate it from the other LGBTQ dedicated channels that populate the market. Reverie builds itself around disruption of LGBTQ mainstreaming, of systems for generating revenue, and of TV's traditional development and distribution pipelines. These elements have been constitutive of Reverie from its founding and arguably support the relevance of the LGBTQ channel, especially its ties to identity politics. I want to show you a brief promo for the platform to give you a feel for how they promote it in sort of a 30 second clip. So Reverie's launch came at a time when LGBTQ television was rep representation was on the rise. Vulture published an article titled LGBTQ characters hit record highs, noting increases in LGBTQ characters across broadcast cable and streaming. These quote record highs directly corresponded to the burgeoning streaming industry as major, major players quickly made LGBTQ programming central to their content offerings. LGBTQ itself became its own category in their digital libraries. As a result, LGBTQ pro programming became comparable to a genre because it appeared alongside familiar categories like comedies and dramas. In addition, these platforms made programs with LGBTQ characters and storylines a consistent part of their forays into original programming. The presence, oops, that went away. I, I put you, I made that go away. How do I come bring this back? Sorry, hold on a second. Okay, there we go. Um, the presence and success, both popular and critical, of shows on broadcast cable and streaming led to claims that LGBTQ representation had become mainstream. Arguments about the mainstream status of LGBTQ television come in two main forms. One, descriptive. 
LGBTQ characters and storylines had become an expected part of the Western TV landscape, and second, a critique that these representations are predominantly normative ones that, quote, reinforce class, race, gender, and national hierarchies in queer cultures. Reverie launched in the midst of and in response to mainstreaming discourses. In fact, the platform takes a clear stance against, ma against mainstreaming culturally, politically, and technologically. It positions itself in opposition to mainstreaming's post-gay claims, which have gained popularity in culture, politics, and media since the 1990s. When introduced, the term post-gay reflected the perception that the, quote, gay community had gradually moved from the exoticized margin to the normalized straight center. In the ensuing decades, terms like post-closet and post-queer, which encompasses a broader range of identities, have also entered the lexicon to suggest that LGBTQ equality has been achieved and therefore that LGBTQ identities are not struggles to overcome or to make the focus of media storytelling. However, we, however, Reverie's founders rejected the notion that LGBTQ people have achieved full equality in culture and media, and the claim that a post-gay society is inclusive of the range of LGBTQ identities. Since its founding, Reverie has created its promotions and platform structure around an intentionally broad definition of LGBTQ-ness. Rather than focusing primarily on the quote, sizable audiences that are the non-negotiable bottom line for programmers, Reverie's FAQ page states, LGBTQ is a demographic, queer is a culture. At its core, Reverie is about presenting queer culture as it is. On one hand, this language ironically and problematically reinforces the idea that queer culture is somehow essential and fixed. However, from an industrial perspective, this language helps Reverie separate itself from the demographic heavy talk of the television industry. This industry speak has intensified in the network era amidst, amidst increasing competition for viewers, flexible microcasting practices, and algorithm-driven curated programming. By embracing the language of queer culture, Reverie pushes back against post-gay discourse, a tactic reflected in the platform's programming. Through programs both acquired and original, Reverie features a wide array of LGBTQ people and issues. Barbell, for example, which is an acquired series, follows pop duo lovers Veronica and Alice as they reach stardom and then decide to break up. However, they learn that they are contractually obligated to continue making music and to maintain the facade of a romantic relationship. The show has been hailed as, quote, the queer, female-driven show you've been waiting for, in part a reference to the consistent lack of queer-identified female protagonists on TV. Acquired series The Av and original series Queerencia also represent some of those LGBTQ people often omitted from television. The Av is a drama that centers around a group of Black entrepreneurs attempting to rise above the streets of Brooklyn, while Querencia is a love story that navigates the complex intersectional identities of two Indigenous queer women. Mainstreaming, mainstreaming seldom leaves, leaves room for these kinds of characters, a byproduct of how post-gay discourse primarily supports those quote, whose behaviors and styles of dress adhere tr to traditional norms of gender and sexuality and to conventional ideas about love, monogamy, and marriage. Reverie's docuseries are also prime examples of the platform's attempt to push back against the, quote, cosmetic and superficial visibility afforded by post-gay television. Like other streaming services, Reverie has invested in documania, especially in what Hunter Hargraves describes as prestige documentary. Reverie features numerous docuseries about a broad range of LGBTQ identities. The Reverie original, Room to Grow, chronicles the stories of seven LGBTQ teens and families in cities across the U.S., offering a look into their daily lives as they try to find their own identities and their place in their respective communities. America in Transition, the digital series, features, pri features primarily trans people of color and brings, quote, brings you intimate trans stories you won't hear anywhere else. 
Similarly, the original three-part series, Them, focuses on offering inspirational and uplifting stories, that's a quote from the site, from those in the trans and gender non-conforming community. Uh, I wanted to show you a brief um, trailer for America in Transition or kind of a promo reel for the series. Oh, I just want to feel alive I'll make it to the other side Oh, I just want to see grass And I'm just growing where I'm at I feel like I live in a different world Don't matter the language, I can never be heard But like anybody else, all I want is love So in them, and in America in Transition, Reverie engages with the rise of transgender visibility, especially on US television. With the increase in trans representations, Andre Cavalcante observes, quote, gender variance has moved from the margins of society to enter the mainstream national conversation. This rise, however, has predominantly featured transgender characters and personalities who reinforce binary notions of gender. In other words, trans women on television tend to be stereotypically feminine and trans men stereotypically masculine. These representations get significantly get significant attention for raising awareness and recognition, but beg the question, quote, to what extent has transgender life on the ground really changed as a result of this new visibility? Reverie's answer to this question is that televisibility is not a guarantee of cultural and political change, for all LGBTQ people, not just trans people. In 2021, Chief Operating Officer Aliyah Daniels said, quote, as we continue to see more and more queer representation in mainstream media, we also live with the reality of regressive policies toward the LGBTQ plus community. Reverie thus promotes its programming as a response to the types of LGBTQ representations on television and to the ongoing political wars waged against LGBTQ rights and protections. In particular, Reverie makes the case for a quote, queer network through its global reach. This aspect of the platform is one of its major objectives and it features prominently in promotions and press interviews. When Wired reported on Reverie in 2018, it noted, Quote, the service offers up hours upon hours of queer movies and TV to viewers around the world, 116 countries total, including China, where even Netflix can't get past censors. In the article, founder Pelicioni notes that this reach is, quote, super important for Reverie because their global goals are rooted in beliefs about the potential power of television to validate LGBTQ identities, especially in places where they are not safe to be out. For example, Reverie founders regularly talk about providing LGBTQ programming to countries like Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and others where homosexuality is shunned and sometimes outlawed. They frame the global reach of their programming as giving, quote, queer people in those regions a chance to see themselves reflected in media in a way they might never have had otherwise. This focus embodies what I would describe as Reverie's social justice mission. This mission isn't only about providing U.S. content to audiences abroad. Instead, it includes programs about LGBTQ life in other countries. For example, The Other Love Story, acquired from an Indian web series, is about a romantic relationship between two college-age women in 1990s Bangalore. Notably, the global mission also serves as brand differentiation, separating reverie from U.S. channels like Logo and Here. Reverie's queer culture strategy is embodied in a model that combines linear and nonlinear television systems. Using a tribid model, Reverie offers content through ad video on demand, subscription video on demand, and ad supported live TV. Reverie combines the programming strategies of linear channels with those that Amanda Lotz describes as nonlinear portals. In the former, viewers can sign up for a weekly Reverie streaming guide, and the platform utilizes multiplexing, offering eight live channels for viewers to choose from, available on the web and via various apps. Channels include Reverie One, Reverie News, Reverie Latinx, and Reverie X, which is sponsored by Lexus. The automaker Lexus is one of the platform's largest advertisers. 
Wired reported that for, quote, Lexus, the streaming service has provided a way to reach groups that weren't as accessible through something like Hulu or traditional TV. Here, Lexus, sincerely and or for commercial reasons, supports Reverie's claims that mainstreaming is not an effective way of reaching LGBTQ consumers. Reverie's linear features are tied to its mission. Its founders frame live ad-supported content as vital to those who are not able to be out or whose safety may be in danger if an LGBTQ item appears on a credit card statement, as a subscription service would. In an interview, Pelicione recalls, quote, a message he received shortly after the company's launch from a user in Saudi Arabia who thanked the company for, quote, giving him hope for one day being able to live an authentic life and to realize there are other people like him out there. Reverie taps into the subscription economy with fees of $6.99 a month or $59.99 a year. Subscriptions, subscribers engage with what Chuck Tryon calls streaming's, quote, promises of plentitude, participation, prestige, and personalization. Although Reverie's founders present this financial structure as mission-driven, in reality, it is also a system of economic survival in the OTT marketplace. Its two revenue streams thus are multi-purpose. They, serve, they, ser they support Reverie's vision, financial viability, and capacity to compete in the modern television landscape. A crucial aspect of Reverie's economic and cultural structure is its disruption of traditional development pipeline. And I'll just quickly go through this. I'll sort of skip over this little part briefly to say that there's a self-submission guidelines where anyone who's creating this content um, can submit their own work. Um, and this is something that Amar Jean Christian um, has talked about um, as one of the primary ways small-scale channels create value and representation by incentivizing the production of intersectional stories by creators who hail from those communities and by marketing and engaging with those communities after the show is produced. So while many characterize the contemporary television industries as a struggle between legacy channels adapting to new conditions embraced by new portals, Reverie refuses to be one or the other. It retains elements of linear scheduling and viewing and includes features of nonlinear OTT platforms. By integrating these systems, the platform demonstrates that notions of post-gay culture are idealized in popular discourse, but not reflective of reality for most LGBTQ people across the globe. Reverie thus ultimately attempts to affirm the channel and its relevance to LGBTQ identified viewers. Its vision is ambitious and based on a crucial premise that there is this need for LGBTQ content by and for LGBTQ creators and audiences. However, it remains to be seen whether Reverie will sustain financial viability and whether its programming is as inclusive, unapologetically queer and queer TV 24 seven as its promotions would have us believe. Despite these uncertainties, Reverie offers a distinctive example of how channels can disrupt traditional systems to continue to serve a broader range of social minorities in economically viable ways, carving out incisive platforms aimed at niche audiences in an increasingly crowded marketplace. Reverie, I argue, shows the ways these channels are not the that the contrast between OTT and linear are not necessarily in opposition, and instead Reverie offers a framework for an identity-driven channel that is both linear and non-linear. Finally, if there is hope for Reverie, its promise lies in its rejection of cultural mainstreaming and its embrace of diverse, intersectional LGBTQ representations and content by and for LGBTQ audiences. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. That's fabulous. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, we have Philippa Orm um, from the University of St. Andrews. Um, Philippa is a PhD candidate, um, and her thesis, their thesis inter interrogates the queer potential of reality TV, which explores the medium's disruptive ambiguities between observation and obtrusion, performance, authenticity, and sobriety and sensationalism. 
Philippa is also the co-editor and chief at Frame Cinema Journal and is working on an upcoming issue on queer phenomenology and lowbrow media. Over to you, Philippa, and I hope your, your voice will last. Yeah, I'll just say if there's a mist of coming out of a cold, so if I'm a bit quiet, tell me to speak up and I'll try my very best. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that introduction and for the talk, Julia. It's fascinating to hear about Reverie. And I'd like to say thank you for the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk today and for those who've come along. So my paper today is taken from my thesis, as again, which re investigates the queerness of reality television. I will look at MTV's dating show True Love or True Lies. Focusing on the first season, I argue True Lies self-reflexively plays with the formal conventions of reality TV to deconstruct the relationship between queer identity and compulsory authenticity. In doing so, exposing the ways we have come to understand more normative performances of queerness and identity more broadly on screen. To begin, we need to cover some brief groundwork. Reality TV is often defined queer identity in terms of authenticity. Those familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race, for instance, will know contestants must be excellent drag performers, but they must also overcome their internal struggles and embrace their true queer selves for their drag to reach its full potential. As RuPaul loves to call it, as you can see in the image, overcoming your inner saboteur. <laughs> Meanwhile, the eighth season of another MTV dating show, Are You The One, which revamps its formula with a cast of sexually and gender fluid contestants, likewise places its primary emphasis on the processes of self-discovery and confession its queer participants must undergo in order to find their perfect partner among the group. In the image below, you see contestant Noor, who discloses her genuine intentions to explore her bisexuality on the show, rather than resort to the straight relationship she has done at home. Michael Lovelock observes this narrative of compulsory authenticity on reality TV, that individuals possess an innate and essential true self, which is their duty to discover, manifest and be faithful to, has helped normalise certain perceptions of queerness. The idea that trans people are born in the wrong body, for instance, speaks to the sense of core self that an individual must uncover by breaking heteronormative convention and embrace through self-acceptance and the intention surrounding coming out in popular culture, the moment when queer people profess their non-conforming status to the world, is equally mimicked by reality TV's obsession with embodying one's true self through acts of confession and disclosure. This, however, has its problems. As it follows, to be authentically queer on reality TV, you must also possess some form of trauma or some kind of inner turmoil, turmoil you must confess, work through and fix. But most importantly, those who embody queer forms of personhood, challenging popular understandings of sex and gender beyond its fundamental binaries, conflict with reality TV's investment in an essentialized true self. As Lovelock argues, queerness adopts an assimilatory position in its portrayal as abiding, absolute and natural. Ideas not dissimilar to the normalization of heterosexuality, consequently denying queer identity its disruptive force. Nevertheless, in considering the queer potential of television itself, Leanne Joy Rich notes TV is useful because it offers us a model of proliferation, of multiplications, of hybridizations and disseminations, which helps us think outside the restrictive binaries which have often defined queer theory. Binaries such as the oppositional versus the mainstream, queer versus straight, or positive versus negative representation. Yet, I propose reality TV as an intrinsically hybrid form of fact and fiction media could not be more well suited to engage in such methods of contradiction and deconstruction. After all, its mixing of documentary and dramatic, of commercialism and intimate revelation, disrupts the boundaries between the public and the private, which according to Misha Kafka is hardly heteronormative. Building on Joy Rich and Kafka's observations, I argue reality TV disturbs our distinctions between authenticity and performance in ways which can manifest the fluidity and inconsistencies of queer expression and sexual identity more broadly. We can see this at play on True Love or True Lies as it negotiates our understanding of queer identity and authenticity on reality TV and deconstructs its more typical performances of queerness.
on its quest to find the perfect couple. True Lies sees a mix of heterosexual and queer couples compete to be crowned the winning pair. Yet the programme's host, Maya Jama, reveals a catch. Some are lovers, while others are liars, faking their relationship and or sexual orientation to take the 50 grand prize money. On the image to the right, you can see contestants uh, Luke and Jack looking very shocked at that twist there. And with the liars' identities unknown by both the legitimate and the other fake couples, contestants are urged to eliminate the fake pairs to stop them from stealing the 50 grand prize money, while, 50, while viewers at home are encouraged to sort the lovers from the liars. So while True Lies demands couples prove their identities are genuine, it equally toys with a fine line between what is true and what is false and self-reflectively challenges reality TV's own capacity to reveal this distinction. Participants' ritualistic confessional sequences, arguments and emotional reconciliations and the believability of these are continuously interrogated by each other and the show's irreverent narrator, Danny Dyer. For those of you familiar with Dyer from EastEnders, yes, you did hear that correctly. As the show unravels, True Lies entirely collapses the notion of queerness as innately authentic. True Lies at first takes on familiar territory with its Italian mansion setting. Its location is reminiscent of the Bachelor's Villa di Lavina or Love Island's Mallorcan Villa. These are luxurious holiday locations which emphasise their separation from normal everyday life. However, Dio informs us this is not just some bollocky game of love. His playful jab references the contrivances in many dating shows. Such bollockiness being the proposition that true love between real people will be found in real situations, from placing contestants in a constructed setting over which they have a limited control, to requiring genuine emotion within an overtly strategic game. Yet True Lies hardly condemns such contradictions as its claim of difference may suggest. Rather, it delights in them. The show's opening viewer discretion sets this tone, beginning warning this programme contains sexual references and strong language throughout, and a load of couples telling porky pies or and a load of fraudsters trying to trick us all. True Lies gleefully revels in the obscurities between truth and fiction that lie ahead. But with this instability in mind, how does True Lies encourage us to reconsider queer identity and authenticity on reality TV? On one hand, when we are introduced to the queer presenting contestants, they voice their intention to prove their romantic, their, their intention to prove their romantic connections and legitimise their queerness. Chris, who enters with his partner, John, addresses his background in Mr. Strongman competitions and accusations he doesn't appear gay. Both express a desire to validate their relationship by exposing viewers to a modern gay couple and by rejecting stereotypes which determine what homosexual people should or shouldn't look like. Similarly, trans woman D introduce, introduces her relationship with girlfriend Jade with the admission she has never fancied a woman before or identified as a lesbian. She discloses while their attraction may appear anomaly for some, they are their own kind of perfect. Queer contestants thus possess a double purpose, not only to prove their relationships are genuine, but also the in added intention or burden of legitimising their queerness. Yet in a context which deals with the ambiguities between what it takes to be genuine about one's sexual identity or relationship or what it takes to fake it, queer presenting contestants are revealed to have a compelling advantage. For instance, Chris discloses his experience coming out. He discusses the insecurities he faced over his masculinity due to his part-time profession as a bodybuilder and the social pressures of his career path. He says, I used to be so insecure about my body, crazy insecure. The only time I started get getting confident is when I came out as gay. Chris further admits, I spent 28 years of my life being fake. 50 grand wouldn't pay me to be fake for one day. These declarations are convincing in True Lies' early stages. In the opening episodes, queer couples scarcely receive votes deeming them liars, revealing the pervasiveness in which we do associate queer people with authenticity. However, 
True Lies questions what it means to make these confessions on reality TV. Danny Dyer voices his doubts. Chris has opened up in front of the group and told them all a personal story. But is he also pulling the wool over your eyes? And quips, I spent 28 years of my life being fake, but I'm an actor. But if someone told, offered me 50 grand for a day, I'd say yes, please. Dyer's role as chief skeptic embodies the ideal audience member. He encourages to ask questions and maintains, maintains the show's ambiguities between what is truthful and what might be false. But this is not to say that True Lies suggests reality TV is therefore deceptive and its queer contestants must be manipulative. Rather, True Lies negotiates the mechanisms by which we legitimise queer existence as authentic on reality TV and suggestively plays with them as constructed norms. For instance, the subjectivity of queer authenticity further comes into play in True Lies as tensions emerge between the contestants. And Tony and Sophie, a straight presenting couple later revealed to be true lovers, dismiss Chris and John's legitimacy. And Tony claims, I don't see no chemistry with them. I don't feel they look like a couple. And Tony cannot see Chris and John are lovers because they don't represent the couples he is used to seeing. The bewilderment the show's thruple receive, Toppy, Tommy, Kathy and Nicole, continues this theme. They are not what a relationship should be. They make people uncomfortable or have an awkward energy. Although discouraging, such suspicions, suspicions aren't always detrimental for queer presenting contestants. Chris responds to Antoni's doubts. We don't think couples like that would ever understand our relationship. He effectively reconfigures these accusations to reinforce their own authenticity in difference. But it remains ambiguous. Are Chris and John a real couple? Or are they redirecting Antonio's suspicions? True lies continuously shifts how we associate queerness with authenticity according to who directs its judgment. And in all, it offers a refreshing avenue to understand queerness and reality TV. Within the permeable boundaries between what we deem to be authentic or performed, obstructing our attempt to define or categorise. Yet at True Lies most compelling in having contestants explicitly fake their sexuality in ways they anticipate would appear authentic, the show becomes an enlightening mediation on the performances we are used to seeing on reality TV. For instance, Jack, queer himself, reveals he scouted his partner, Luke, to pretend to be gay. Once both are eliminated, Luke's persona entirely changes. His demeanour is more reserved. His posture slackens. His pitch lowers, even exhibiting a voice change. Fellow contestant Mike exclaims, that's a different person I saw out there. I don't know who that was. This might seem offensive, right? True Lies encourages participants to fake gayness, and it's an act riddled with stereotypes. But True Lies also questions what it takes to perform an identity legitimately. It makes us think about the choices we would or wouldn't make, and it asks what it means to un undertake such a performance on reality TV, a media notorious for disrupting the boundaries between authenticity and performance itself. An example occurs between Jack and Luke following an argument with competitors Antoni and Sophie. Jack takes Luke aside and states, I am learning a lot about myself, and that's because of you. Despite Antoni and Sophie's doubts about their relationship, Jack claims he's never had this connection with anyone. And he finishes with the crowning declaration, I genuinely love you. They kiss. Now, as if straight from the workroom of RuPaul's Drag Race, this scene initially appears a familiar example of queer confession on reality TV. The competitive process spurs an awakening of one's true queer self, or in this case, queer relationship, except True Lies then dismantles this trope and reveals its workings. Following their elimination, True Lies then returns to this scene, but this time with more footage. Following the kiss, we see Luke's stunned reaction. He admits, it's sick how good you are at that. It actually turns my stomach. True Lies reflects on how we have come to understand queer identity and morality TV, through notions of authenticity and confession and exposes how constructed yet convincing they can be. In a further example, Cam and Charisse are met with continual suspicions. Most doubt Cameron's straightness 
due to his apparently camp and feminine demeanour. True Lies tries to convince us of this. We were repeatedly reminded of the other's uncertainty and significantly, once Cameron and Sharice earn an advantage, which awards them key clues about the contestants, they learn at least one person is lying about their sexuality. Yet we see them withhold this, effectively sealing our suspicions. However, once eliminated, Sharice reveals she's the gay one. But what does it mean to play it straight on reality TV? Cameron and Sharice's relationship on one hand, echoes displays heterosexuality found on many popular dating shows. For instance, both mirror an on and off again dynamic, not distant from Love Island fan favourites, season three winners, Kem and Amber, who stole the nation's hearts with their breakups and makeups. Cameron and Sharik fight, they cry. Cameron apologises in a chivalrous display of humility. True Lies even offers the pair their own personal orchestra, the soundtrack for one of these reunions featuring a romantic string ballad. True Lies thus sweeps us up in the heartfelt displays before sweeping out the rug from under us. Following a series of clips recapping these moments, Sharice reflects on her efforts to play a role. She corrects, no, a straight role. On one hand, you could argue that in having couples confess their true identities like such in the end, this temptation to essentialize identity still remains. But the lasting effects of True Lies revelations aren't particularly comforting ones. Its final disclosures reflect on the performances of queerness or straightness we're used to seeing, or possibly takes for granted and refuses to give us any stability or any essential truth in these performances. In my finishing points, I reference a quote by, from Judith Butler in Undoing Gender, which I find really quite effectively speaks to True Lies play with sexuality and performance. Much like Butler is looking for, True Lies reflexively explores the conventions of reality TV, not only to understand how the terms of gender and sexuality are instituted, naturalised and established, but also traces the moments where this binary system is disputed and challenged, where the coherence of the categories are put into question and where its very social life turns out to be malleable and transformable. Following the elimination of the thruple Thomas, Kathy and Nicole, a quote from Thomas stuck with me. If you don't understand something, it doesn't mean it's not real, he says following their elimination. This on one hand speaks to identity, because we don't understand someone's sexuality or it disrupts how we see the world. This doesn't mean it isn't legitimate, but it also is a bridge to how reality television can get misunderstood. Although it muddles the boundaries between authenticity and performance, it doesn't mean that means it is fake or it doesn't mean it lacks substance. In fact, what True Lies tells us is that reality TV can also reject categorizations in ways that embraces the constructiveness and the inconsistencies within queer performance and sexual identity more broadly, which makes it such a rich source for television scholars and queer theorists alike. Now that's me done a bit early, but thank you so much for listening. Early is never a problem. Thank you very much, Jennifer. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, can I ask people to maybe um, um, sh show us their faces? So switch your cameras on if you can, um, because that way it feels like we're not just speaking to the three of us, but actually to a room, which is surprising, which is nicely full actually today, which is nice. Um, and can I open the, the virtual floor to your questions, please? So do you have questions? You can um, just put it in the chat or raise your hand. If not, I will go first again, which would be dreadful. What struck me was that both of you were talking quite a lot about disruption. Um, and you know how, which is which is obviously you know, disruption is a term as kind of 
lost some of its power in a way because because it's been used so badly um, by by people like Netflix. Um, when we all know that you know Netflix doesn't disrupt all that much really. Um, so when you, I mean, to some extent, I would I would say you kind of prove that these you know on the one hand the, the reality TV program you're talking about, um, but also Reverie do disrupt. But do they claim this as well? Um, and what happens to that claim, in a way? How how what do we do with this claim of disruption in a way in in this context? Philippa, why don't you go first? I will do. This is what reality TV can be so difficult because even though I see it as something that is disruptive in a lot of ways and I, I'm talking more formally in down in content here I think because the difference of Julia she talks a lot about disruption in content whereas reality TV has so many problems in terms of actually its representation but the way I see it I think there's a lot of potential there in terms of how it constructs the world that can actually offer modes of uh, disruption and represent queerness in ways that escape trying to categorize and define it's this or that and I think um, that's what True Lives kind of engages of those qualities of reality TV quite effectively. Um, but I agree, it's hard because I would be doubtful to say that something like True Love or True Lies could set itself up as something that is really challenging about identity. I wouldn't say that it does. I think I'd say that you can find qualities about reality TV that are disruptive, that it picks up on, has potential. But I think it's never kind of quite transparent in its claims especially because it can be so devious i think at times it's kind of hard to say that whether julia yeah i agree with you so much about the reality tv piece and i was even thinking about some of those connections in terms of all the docuseries that reverie has um so there's some i think some interesting overlap there and and i agree with you in, in fact when i was presenting my paper today, I was thinking about, I, when I even read disruption, I thought it just went through my head. That word is just, it's used in business so much now, right? As like, we're a disruptor. And it, and it's so, so it, it has done exactly what you describe and, and been used in all these, these ways that are just take away from any sort of like, what is disruptive anymore? And in the ways that I think we're trying to use it. And for me with Reverie, as I sort of tried to indicate at the end, like I'm, I'm unsure and potentially even suspicious about whether this is actually truly the kind of disruption we would really like to be seeing, or even that something like Reverie is promising to be. Um, and my only sort of way of trying to wrap my head around it was through a combination of thinking not just about the content and the representations and their promotions and the ways that these founders talk about it, but also in this kind of combination of how it's operating in terms of the industry and in terms of these linear and nonlinear models that I think give it some potential, but again, without any idea truly of the impact, they can make claims all day that they're in all these countries and they have all these viewers and they have data on how many hours per week they think people are watching. But I just, again, in that sense of like, are we disrupting queer narratives? Are we disrupting kind of the mainstreaming narratives? Um, I don't know, you know, and, and that's what I find sort of fascinating about something like Reverie. Like, I think it has potential, but I also um, have some doubts about whether it's truly doing that. It's a great question. I saw it. Sorry, um, Rosie had her, her hand up briefly, so. Rosie, do you want to come in? Sorry, yeah, I I mean, I thought that was a really interesting question. I was going to ask something very, very superficial, which was about the design quality of um, particularly the shows on Reverie that you were talking about, Julia, because it seems so retro. The whole kind of graphics that they use are sort of, 90s possibly even 80s at times and I wondered if that was a kind of deliberate marketing ploy that somehow this is tapping in some sort of notion of heritage queerness you know from earlier decades I don't know that's just a kind of speculation completely 
I think the found, I think the founders would love to own something like that and to say that's exactly <laughs> what we were going for because I think in some ways that's maybe a generous interpretation of it. Um, you know what they've talked about a lot is that they these four people were sitting around and feeling like looking across streaming platforms they couldn't find something only LGBTQ and they could find you know, the sort of queer content here and there or like these categories, but they couldn't find something only. And so they wanted to create this. And my sense is that it's more the consequence of lack of budget. I know they have investors and they have, but I, I'm not convinced, I'm not sure that it's an aesthetic move that is designed to be a about a certain queerness, but I think it's great if some of us see it that way, because I think it it then maybe to go back to the disruption can have certain disruptive qualities around the aesthetics. Um, but I don't, maybe I should give them more credit than I am, but I don't think it's, it, it, it's an intentional move. What I found with a lot of the content is it also has that feel almost to the point that some of it you're like, I don't know if I want to watch this. Like it, it doesn't, you know, that, that question of sort of quality programming, I think comes to play in terms of what they're presenting, especially in their original series. Um, and at the same time, I think that points out some of the problems that have come up with, you know, things like platforms like Netflix, giving someone like Ryan Murphy, you know, a $300 million deal. And then, something like Reverie, where they truly are taking self submissions from queer creators and getting their content out there. And so that's that actually seems important to me, even if some of it I feel like doesn't have the kinds of quality that I've become accustomed to on, on other platforms. But um, I think that's a great way to look at some of their promotions. Actually. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that question was really good. Um, Richard, you have your hand up. Hello, um, thank you. Thank you both so much for uh, fascinating papers. Uh, re I'm really interested. I've got loads of sort of half questions, but um, I've sort of settled on one. <laughs> um, so you, you both talked a lot about the content and I wondered whether you'd given any thought to um, how sort of the potential of um, the platform or the um, particular um, series that you're looking at, uh, Philippa, for audiences to engage in a way that we might consider queer. So, um, so it, it seems it seems to me that there's there's kind of there's some obvious uh, ways that uh, reality television and television that isn't viewed uh, linearly uh, kind of offers us queer ways to kind of engage with it. And I just wondered whether you sort of given any thought to that for either of your projects? And um, if so, what kind of evidence do you think um, we could use to kind of get a sense of that? I'll go. I've, I have considered that, not actually in um, terms of MTV specifically, um, but I think an obvious example, for instance, that does that is with the WOW, Sense Plus and the RuPaul's Drag Race thing. And that's got its whole kind of engagement that kind of almost supports and encourages viewers to engage in ways that support kind of their own um, kind of freedoms, I suppose. Uh, and they're, I guess, in their own maybe subcultures, uh, I guess, when you have um, all the different kind of spin-off shows that happen with RuPaul's on YouTube or on, but then so much of it is behind, and RuPaul's Drag Race behind a pay paywall as well, when you have the subscription service to WoW Present Plus and things. Um, but I feel, a lot of it maybe there there's a connection to be made between is is it more queer engagement if you kind of offer offer a roads of engagement that go against what a kind of a company is telling you to do or like you you have to review this way but if you can do it on your own power and your own flexibility in your own terms and create from the fan page of the Brupal's Drag Race create your own modes of engagement and your own podcasts is that something that could be deemed as a more of queer engagement and, and has it picked up on that I don't know I mean, it's something that I've not thought fully about MTV I think I don't know but much in terms of the way it does that but I do know that I feel especially with um, True Love or True Lies and 
was also with Are You The One as well, which had its um, like the spin-off queer season, which you know, has a whole wealth of problems, but um, they often present themselves kind of in opposition to other reality shows that are straight or in the sense that, oh, we're doing something better than this, so therefore it's different, especially when you think of the when True Lies was out just when the fourth season of Love Island was on. And there was kind of uh, opposition like, oh, this is what you're used to seeing here. But no, it's so much more different and it's so much more like exciting here. It's not just like straight. So I think it almost sets up itself up in opposition in some ways as a channel. But I don't, that's my random tra trailed half formed thoughts to your question anyway. <laughs> that's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that question because I thought about that with Reverie in, in part because it's relatively new and, you know, only being a few years old. Um, and I, I did some digging to see if I could even find just, for example, some fan engagement online um, where people were either talking about these shows or they were talking about the platform itself in ways that I thought, or I wondered, you know, did this ref could this reflect some ownership? Could this reflect some interesting interpretations and, and engagement with the content? And I really didn't find any, um, which again led me to be a little bit led me to questions about how do we tell what the impact of this network is when you have all these, you know, obviously all this promotional material. Um, you know, is it really doing what it promises to do? I do think the the way that they emphasize sort of LGBTQ content for and by LGBTQ people is so in line with the industry sort of emphasis now on queer storytellers telling queer stories. Um, so I, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of it. And I also wonder if that's in part, there was just a, a New York Times article um, here that I was briefly interviewed for, but what he was talking about, I didn't mean that to drop that, like I was interviewed, but but what the reason, it's the reason I was so familiar with it, because what the, the journalist was identifying was that there's this plethora of mainstream LGBTQ stories and characters that people are engaging with in those ways. And so this to me is where kind of mainstreaming um, becomes even harder to break through for a network like Reverie, where if they're really trying to do something different, if they're really trying to queer queer television, um, can they do that in the face of this giant sort of wall that presents itself um, in the form of, of kind of the effects of mainstreaming and how much content there is on these large platforms with these large budgets that include queer characters and storylines, some of which are actually quite progressive and interesting and young generations have embraced and are talking about on social media and other places. So um, I think that the most challenging piece of that does come in, in the form of the kind of vast quantity of content out there within that kind of mainstreamed landscape. And again, I didn't find what I thought I might find in terms of queer audience engagement online with these series. That's brilliant. Thank you both. That's really interesting. Um, one of the things that <laughs> that this question sort of got me to think about is, is in a way, at the end of the day, um, even though Reverie wants to be, you know, global, um, I think it's safe to say that it nevertheless speaks largely to an American audience, probably. And on the other hand, True Love and or True Lies is made for MTV UK, I assume, yeah? Um, so considering, you know, I, I'm just thinking about national context here a little bit, because you were also referring to that to some extent, Julia, about, you know, the, the, the stuff that's going on in America at the moment with the potential of um, the Supreme Court uh, basically going back in terms of law, etc., cetera, um, and thus um, undermining LGBTQ rights, et cetera. Obviously, we've got um, issues in the UK as well, but they, they may be not quite as, I hope they're not quite so much in our face as they are in America. Um, 
so so I was just wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit about the the, con the national context in a way and how within the context that um, these the channel on the program um, operate um, there is space for more or less having to define identity as fixed versus greater playfulness. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Tell me if I tell me, though, if I don't answer your question. Um, I agree with you, I think, and I think most of its programming, whether acquired or original, is not just based on is, is not just for US audiences, but I think it's also very much by LGBTQ Americans who are operating within that national context and those national conversations, um, which are absolutely national, right? And are very much centered in the ways in which the LGBTQ rights movement has evolved in this country and has, um, you know, as you, as you say, you know, it, there are many questions here going around now about whether you know marriage equality is going to be struck down um, as sort of next, um, since you know our Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas sort of paved the or opened the door for that to be very much a possibility, among other things, um, and 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 so I think they're speaking very much to that moment and that context. And I think that's actually especially true from my observations of their content in terms of transgender representation that seems to me very nationally specific in terms of the conversations that are happening, um, the the ways in which the language around trans identity um, is has changed, I think, quite a lot in the last 10 years, especially in terms of visibility and representation, and then the ways that we have these conversations and that they're presented in media. Um, so, the, and but remind the, the second part of your question, though, was a little different. Remind me of that second part. I just wondered if that national context basically requires a kind of firmness and fixedness in in terms of how it presents identity? In a lot of ways, yes. And I find this to be sort of a consistent struggle where in some ways, in some ways actually I think they're trying to make it their best attempt at a challenge to those identities. And especially when you get into um, some of the representations that are say about non-binary characters or you know uh participants in say a docu-series um who do embrace more of kind of you know what cedric might call the universalizing view right of gender and or sexuality um in terms of this change over time being a possibility um but i think to a large degree because of the ties to identity politics the fixity becomes really hard to break away from Yeah, I mean, I can add to that that you couldn't really be more different in terms of the one we were talking about. On one hand, you know, one's a lot about the kind of fixity and the importance of that, like like Elk said, but also, I guess, with true love or true lies, it kind of again it, it revels in, in not allowing us that. Um, and if there's anything nationally specific about not allowing us that, I think I don't know. I feel like part of, part of it plays into nothing that's to do with queer culture much in, in the sense that with Danny Dyer for instance so much of it of the program as he's the voice of it right so much of it plays into his persona as we know him as kind of a cultural figure you know his kind of trying to like sniff out the liars sniff, you know the kind of bat, you know, that kind of dry humor as well and there's a lot of that and I think it's part of almost um anything could be untrue but then at the same time you know that doesn't mean it's any less emotionally effective or any less authentic he's always at, always blurring the boundaries and never giving us that that fixity which i find interesting about it um i think the only one message in it as far as it even goes in terms of to kind of make it uh an, 
an act of maybe activism, which it, it, I wouldn't say it is, but if anything, it does. It, in the opening, it says, you know, we believe love comes in all shapes and sizes. And that's the most it goes to kind of make that claim. And that's all it allows, which is something that I don't mind as much about it. And I found quite attractive about it when you're watching something and it's claiming to be, oh, we, we're this for these group of people. We've done this for you. And you're watching and it always kind of seems quite contrived and it's never going to be right. It's never going to be. That's always an impossible aim in, in a sense, whereas it, at least it, it doesn't kind of try and set us up, itself up as something like that, which I found appealing about it. But again, like I said, it doesn't come without its problems, but that's kind of where I stand on that. I think I would just add to that with something like Reverie, I think they do get themselves a little stuck in the sense that by claiming there's a need for an LGBTQ channel or they make the claim that there is this need for a dedicated space, even if they want to call it queer culture and the way that they try with their language, I think to signal something maybe less fixed and, and more fluid, for example. But I think by claiming the need for that space, they do that based on like even the quote from from the chief operating officer I read where you know, she's really operating out of one, the US context, but the US political context, which she's making an argument that because of the kind of regressive policies being put into place at, at local levels, state levels, national levels, that we need this. But that situates the network and its representations squarely within a very mainstream, essentialist, fixed, identity category um, process, right? And so I think they get themselves in this bind in a way where they can't quite be perhaps even as queer as they want to be, or maybe as transgressive as they want to be, because that's how they're making the argument that they need to be here. That's really interesting. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, if there is no more questions, um, can I've we... I've got a quick question, actually. Yes. Just for Julia, actually, this one, because I know you, you mentioned it um, briefly in one of the questions, but you said a lot of the programming um, primarily is to them towards like quality television, quality kind of broadcasting. Is that correct? Yeah, is that a lot of it? Well, I think they're, they're aspiring to that, but I don't think they're yeah. succeeding in that. And I mm -hmm. think that's what makes the desire to watch it a little difficult, right? When even I was viewing some of these programs, it's like mm -hmm. there are other things I could watch, unfortunately, that it would be more interesting. So I think they're aspiring to it, but I don't think they're quite succeeding. Why would you think that kind of programming is particularly important, specifically for kind of queer representation? Having that, what's the difference between the quality TV and say having something that's not? And what are the like differences, you know? Well, even I think to go back to, I believe, Rose's question on comment, I think in so many ways it would be actually, it could be seen as far more powerful to not be going the quality TV route, right? Um, and yet I think audiences are so now trained to that model that it becomes hard to hold, I mean, and maybe this is too reductionist, but I think in some ways it holds, it's harder to hold people's attention when there is so much content, um, when that isn't the kind of programming. I mean, you, it would have to be people seeking out this kind of perhaps queer aesthetic and this queer sort of difference that isn't about quality TV. Um, I'm just not sure necessarily they're reaching those people or, um, and again, I think it's hard with if they're trying to get a, as big an audience as they want to do that to people who've become so accustomed to that model of, of television. But so, it's something more to think about, so thank you. Great. Can we then um, thank Philippa and Julia again for their really interesting papers and um, again, we need to look more at the outliers of television, clearly. I'm learning so much, so thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And have a good uh, day, Julia, Thanks. and uh, a good rest of the day, Philippa. Bye, thank you.